we can start and I'm, I'm optimistic, I stay optimistic that Alicia will be able to, to join us. Um, uh, first of all, thank you very much for uh, being part of this discussion. It's an honor for us to host uh, uh, one more uh, web talk uh, with the uh, participation of uh, uh, experts uh, in the field. We did not necessarily choose by nationalities, but uh, our idea was more of uh, having a meaningful experts discussion about the issue. This is why we also have a Georgian participant and, a, uh, and two participants from the uh, international organizations. Um, uh, first of all, let me give the floor to Peter Anders, Anders Bochmann, uh, who is the head of uh, Friedrich Naumann Foundation uh, South Caucasus office, and uh, whose idea was this whole uh, web talk um, series starting already from March, and then we can uh, continue with the discussion. Peter? Yeah, thank you, Tina Teen. Uh, we are very happy that uh, you and uh, Civic Idea organized again such a web talk. Because uh, from our point of view, I think it's necessary that we talk to each other, even if we have conflict situations and war situations like this. And it's very necessary. As long as we talk to each other, it's much better than not to talk with each other. And so far, uh, I'm a little bit sad that not so many uh, panelists did agree to join our web talk today from Armenia and also from Azerbaijan because as long as we talk to each other, it's better. If we do not talk to each other anymore, then only the weapons talk, and that's not a good solution. So that's why thank you for joining us, the panelists especially, and I wish you a fruitful discussion. And let's hope that you will maybe introduce some good ideas, some wise ideas, how to solve the conflict because nobody wants the conflict and the conflict will only lead to a, a worse situation in the whole South Caucasus, not only in the two countries. So thank you again for joining us and have a good talk. Thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you very much. Let me first introduce the panel for all the uh, attendees. Also, please send us your questions or comments. Uh, uh, during the whole discussion, you can start right now, and we will try to take as much questions as possible. Um, the, um, yes. At this moment, uh, unfortunately, we do not have an Armenian participant because this morning we've got a refusal from uh, him uh, to talk, although uh, we are open to, uh, to uh, get back uh, to, we've sent an email to, to many uh, other um, uh, analysts from Armenian side and are still waiting uh, uh, for any of them if they will decide to join us. Um, now we have, um, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Arzu Gaibala, who is an Azerbaijani columnist and writer with a special focus on digital authoritarianism and its implications on human rights and press freedom in Azerbaijan. In the past, Arzu has written for Al Jazeera, Eurasia Net, a Foreign Policy Democracy Lab, CODA uh, for the Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, and lots of other publications. So she is a contributor to Open Democracy, IWPR, and uh, Observatorio Balconi Caucas. So I hope I pronounced it properly um, as well. So uh, in 2014, she was named by BBC amongst 100 women change makers. And uh, in uh, 2019, Arzu launched an Azerbaijani internet watch platform that documents and monitors information controls in Azerbaijan. She is currently based in Istanbul and I had the privilege and honor of uh, uh, knowing Arzu from our joint uh, program in Prague, Czech Republic a couple of years ago. Thank you Arzu for, for being with us. Another speaker uh, we have today is Bakhtiar Aslano. Bakhtiar is currently the project coordinator for the Berkov Foundation's multi-year project Memory Alternative History of Azerbaijan, um, as well as he's an independent researcher in peace studies. He holds a master's degree in peace and conflict studies from Uppsala University in Sweden, uh, where he was a Rotary Peace Fellow. He has conducted 
quantitative and qualitative research, research of the uh, Nagorno-Karabakh conflict and uh, uh, collaborated with uh, many international organizations working on this subject. Uh, he was engaged in several peace building projects, delivering trainings on peace and conflict resolution, dealing with the war and displacement trauma, fostering dialogue between the two sides of the conflict, as well as developing educational materials for peace educator. He used to teach international conflicts and uh, conflict studies at the uh, Hazar University in Baku. Uh, Eka Agobia uh, comes from Georgia. She is the Dean of the Caucasus School of Governance at the uh, Caucasus University and also faculty member of the Tbilisi State University International Relations Department. For those of our uh, uh, attendees, who've attended previous discussions. You might remember Eka from uh, one of our previous web talks um, uh, in spring. Eka holds PhD uh, in international relations and is a lecturer, as already said, in both Billy State University and Caucasus University uh, in Georgia. Uh, she's teaching international relations, international organizations, US peacekeeping operations, EU external relations courses, um, and is, uh, publicly very active as a policymaker, opinion maker, and experts uh, on these issues. She has graduated international relations from uh, Baylor University, United States, and uh, uh, political sciences from uh, Horsewick College. She has participated in several senior level non-degree programs, such as the NATO Senior Executive Master's course and Summer University on federalism, constitutionalism, and conflict transformation in multi-ethnic societies, University of Freiburg in Switzerland, and the uh, qualitative research method course from Syracuse University. Uh, Eka has an extensive experience of work as a uh, diplomat. She served at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for, of Georgia for 11 years and was in charge of um, several departments um, in there. So um, this is our panel right now, and hopefully we will get Alicia, and uh, once she joins us, we will introduce her as well. Um, uh, I will be moderating this panel. We will be on for about an hour. Uh, and once again, please send us your questions, um, comments, and we will try to hear them as much, as much as we can. So let me give the floor first to Arzu uh, and to all the panelists actually for seven, 10 minutes uh, introduction of your um, uh, take on the uh, current state of affairs in the South Caucasus, obviously focusing on Nagorno-Karabakh. Today, what we wanna do is a more, to talk more extensively about the international context of the conflicts, international players, the role as you see, for the European Union, United States, Russia, Turkey, any uh, country or international organization you feel important to talk about. Uh, and also why now, why, uh, why the conflict restarted now and uh, uh, what does it tell to all of us? Uh, so Arzu, the floor is yours. Um, and please take about 10 minutes uh, for the introductory remarks. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, and it's, yeah, the honor is all mine for meeting you as well in, in, in our program in Prague. Um, you know, now that it's been a month, uh, uh, two days after, uh, so a month and two days since the war uh, broke out, it's really, I think I look back at some of the analysis that was made since the start of this war um, and throughout the war. You know, the first time there was ceasefire that was announced, um, there was this slight hope that maybe fighting will stop, but the long-term observers of this conflict and long-term observers of the relations between the two countries said that this fighting is not going to stop and that it will recontinue once again. And this is what happened. And then we saw another ceasefire. Again, it didn't hold and fighting continued. And then we saw another ceasefire. And at this point, I think the meeting that is supposed to that was supposed to happen today in Geneva between the foreign ministers of Armenia and Azerbaijan, which has been rescheduled to tomorrow, as far as I understand, according to Ria, um, you know, the expectation is probably not very high because we've been seeing these meetings, these negotiations take place, but we haven't really seen significant progress made in this conflict. Um, and it's really important to say this because especially, you know, over the last four weeks, every time we 
we read about a bombing, every time we read about shelling, every time we read about human loss, uh, especially the one that we saw yesterday as well in Barda uh, with 20 over casualties uh, of people who've been killed, innocent civilians, and as well as um, countless others who've been wounded. Um, I think it's really important to understand that this conflict, this war won't stop until there are concessions made on both sides. And this is, I think, uh, puts it puts it to a place where we from very different from where we started on September 27th, because then, you know, the assumption was, okay, maybe it will last for a couple of days and then things will quiet down, but it didn't. And so at this point in time, I think what we really need to um, take into account is that, you know, if we're talking about um, any any pause in this conflict, we were talking about de-escalation, immediate de-escalation. We're talking about guarantees of neither of this from both sides not to um, bomb and shell the other and also return to negotiation table, but with, with major concessions. Um, so it's, it's going to be very interesting to see what's going to happen tomorrow in Geneva as well. Um, as for, you know, the, you've, you know, the topic is um, the cost of conflict. And I think the, the humanitarian losses, the human, the human losses that we've seen in this conflict has been um, just, uh, it's really hard to describe the pain, obviously. It's really hard to describe um, the emotions and the emotions are very high. At least this is what I'm hearing at all times from, from uh, the community in Azerbaijan saying, well, emotions are very high. Everyone wants to see an end to this. And so, you know, let's 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 wait and and, and see for, more, for 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 any kind of development. But we're forgetting the hum, human cost of this conflict, and I think this also needs to be kept on the agenda. That yes, there is a war, but then why um, we're not really putting into perspective um, the importance of human life that is being lost? Um, I feel like it's not really mentioned um, enough uh, in in the conversation. Um, and as for the strategic or um, regional in, in involvement in this conflict, I mean, from the very beginning, we've seen Turkey take a very active role in, um, in this war. Uh, they've supported Azerbaijan militarily, they've supported Azerbaijan politically, but I think um, we're, 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 we're looking too much into the role of Turkey. I mean, Azerbaijan is not dependent on role on, on Turkey um, in this context, in this, in this particular conflict. And I think, um, you know, making it, well, Turkey, Turkey is Azerbaijani, like, yes, they've made it very clear on numerous occasions. Yes, they've made statements. The Ministry of Defense of Turkey recently said, if Azerbaijan needs any kind of military assistance, uh, we're ready to provide it um, upon their request. But again, you know, if this if this uh, relationship stops at any point, if if all of a sudden Turkey decides that it's again on the side of de-escalation, which is where it's been for many years as a member of the OEC Minsk group, um, until this 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 conflict escalated, um, Azerbaijan isn't Azerbaijan's um, Azerbaijan is not dependent on it. Um, and I think this is really important to note. Whether, as for other actors, I would, I would leave it to, to other experts on this panel to comment on it. But I think at this point, you know, we all understand that the frustrations of this conflict were so high on the side of Azerbaijan. Um, you know, having um, not seen the engagement from the US in, the, in, in recent years, um, and overall US being not so interested, especially in considering the last few months or this year in general because of the um, elections coming up next week. This engaged Europe as well. I wouldn't say that there were many actors who were so much involved um, in it outside of the OEC immense group. So um, there was a growing frustration of this conflict not getting enough attention um, among the international actors and decision makers. Um, similarly, the the promise, the one the one time promise when when Pashinyan came to power, when Prime Minister Pashinyan came to power in 2018 and and perhaps there was this hope that things would change and, and relations would, would improve, um, completely failed um, due to uh, some recent controversial statements made by, by Prime Minister Pashinyan. And so um, everything around this conflict that we used to know, or at least think that we knew, um, changed. Um, and it has changed even more um, since the conflict, since the fighting began on September 27th. And we're obviously seeing new actors get involved. Um, and 
again, all of the all of the conversation that is taking place around this um, needs to be also taken with a pinch of salt because everything is new um, and any kind of development that we're going to see, I think needs to start from the promise um, to de-escalate and come back to a negotiation table. I will end my, my introduction, introductory notes here, if that's okay. Uh, thank you, Ozo. Uh, thank you very much. Obviously, we can all agree that uh, starting point should be de-escalation and going back to the negotiation table. Uh, let me, uh, I'm happy to see Alicia uh, joining us. Let me introduce uh, her uh, and, uh, and give her the floor for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, introductory remarks. Alicia uh, represents the uh, International Crisis Group. She's a senior analyst for the South, South Caucasus region based in Tbilisi. She researches and produces reports on regional security. Uh, for Armenia, Georgia, and Azerbaijan, with obvious particular focus on breakaway regions in the South Caucasus, Abkhazia, Nagorno-Karabakh, and South Ossetia. Uh, Olicia worked as a journalist before joining uh, International Crisis Group. Um, in 2016, she uh, was writing for uh, Radio Free Europe, uh, as well as many other uh, publications. Uh, she contributed in 2008 during the Russia-Georgia war to the New York Times um, groundbreaking investigation to the conflict. Uh, and uh, in, due to the fact that she enjoyed an access to Abkhazia for a number of years, she was able to cover the issues that were normally close to the Georgian media and international media as well. In 2013, Olicia received the first European Union Monitoring Mission Special Prize in Peace Journalism. Uh, she holds master's degree from the King's College uh, London's War Department and from the Georgian Institute of Public Affairs. Uh, welcome again, Alicia. Uh, and once again, we are ready and open to have uh, our Armenian participants back to the floor if they decide to join the panel. Alicia, the floor is yours. And I'm really sorry that I... Uh... I had a real fight. It was definitely not like Nagorno-Karabakh war, but it was a war with Zoom. <laughs> For some reason, I, I was having these problems, these technical problems, but very nice to join you. And also to see so many females. Uh, I have been participating in many pan panels, you know, during this, uh, especially during this, uh, uh, since the war started. And this is probably the first panel where I'm not the only female. <laughs> so very nice uh, to be with you. Uh, well, you know, I will probably say some very obvious things, uh, because I understand that you already had your discussion with the Armenian and Azerbaijani participants, and probably during our Q&A, we, we could go into more details. Um, I think uh, one of kind of most obvious things, and probably I'm definitely not the only one who can send that, is that uh, the region will definitely not be the same after this war, uh, no matter how it finishes. We can see an increased uh, um, influence of the regional powers of Russia and Turkey. And uh, for sure, while the fighting is still continuing, and I, I personally do not see really kind of, you know, the end to this, and not only what because of what Arzu said, but uh, actually, you know, seems like always um, hopes that there can be a uh, quick, uh, um, you know, peace plan that can uh, somehow substitute to this desire coming from Baku to finally get uh, back the territories and also Nagorno-Karabakh uh, itself. Uh, it's not there. It's not in the place. And um, until diplomacy is able to replace the fighting, I'm, I'm afraid that we are to see a continuous war. Maybe there will be a short pause at certain point, but um, no, no real end uh, anytime soon, I'm, I, I'm afraid. And this is really very difficult for me to say because I have um, friends and even relatives, you know, who are fighting on both sides. And, uh, and, and uh, every day we receive uh, news about people uh, who died. I, I'm afraid uh, I don't know a single person uh, in Armenia and Azerbaijan who have already not lost either a friend or a relative. 
um, so this is uh, really something uh, that, that is happening, but I'm afraid uh, this is also to lead to some fundamental uh, shifts uh, in the region because um, Russia will definitely have uh, a bigger role here and Turkey uh, for sure, because uh, uh, in addition uh, to this cooperation that has been in place between Azerbaijan and Turkey for many years, and which no one tried to hide, right? I mean, we all knew that Turkey is selling weaponry, that Turkey is uh, sharing intelligence, supports with the training and all of that. And uh, we, we see much, uh, I mean, more visible involvement right now. And this is not uh, only with reports of the mercenaries that, uh, that are coming from Syria uh, with the Turkish support, but also the um, apparent presence uh, of uh, at least uh, of a certain uh, of a certain contingent, and of course uh, with unconditional support that is coming to Ankara, it's definitely not helping in terms of the of fighting uh, finding a, a way to cease with fighting for at least some time, and not not to mention uh, uh, kind of prospects for a more long lasting peace uh, in this region, I would say. Um, the second kind of obvious thing uh, that uh, one can observe right now, what we are seeing is that which is the war with very modern technology, uh, but uh, the war is still happening according to this middle age rules, I would say. So we see lots of drones, different technology uh, happening, all with strikes, lots of ro rockets and, and missiles being fired in different places. But at the same time, we see um, very little or close to zero respect uh, to the fact that there are civilian areas, especially inside the conflict zone from the very beginning uh, of this war. Um, you know, for more than a week, I can tell you that I had uh, some people uh, who I knew in person, who I know in person in Stepanakert and who could not leave their bomb shelters. Just uh, even just to bring water or to get some products. So um, this is something that, that is in place and not to mention the more, I mean, the continuous war crimes with beheadings of the military and also with some shooting that took place, you know, in front of the cameras. And, I, you know, this is something that is not going to stay just on one side, I'm afraid. If these uh, kind of crimes are not addressed, uh, they, 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 we, there will be a chain reaction to that. And of course, this kind of thing, they're not only escalating the fighting, because the fighting, of course, I mean, one can say that it is about politics, territory, and so on. But the fighting definitely is getting driven by this, uh, this kind of casualties, you know, and different... I mean, and, and troubles uh, uh, that the, the people um, have to face. Um, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm really very sorry to say that, but uh, look, I mean, I'm, I'm the person of the post-war generation and, um, and we still had to live with the legacy of the first war uh, with all the stories, terrible stories of some crimes that took place during the first war and no one addressed them. And that definitely, you know, pro provoke additional hatred, I would say, and did not contribute to the reconciliation. And if we, uh, the current crimes are not addressed as well, then uh, uh, this is something that we are leaving to the next generations. And uh, my third point is, uh, you know, and this is something that probably I, as a person who studied that and who works on that, I, I, uh, it's a personal tragedy in a way. It's a failure of any kind of pre pre prevention, you know, the notion of prevention. We all are waiting for something terrible to happen in order to see some strong statements coming from the international community or, um, or some sort of intervention taking place. And I'm not talking only about intervention in military means, but in diplomatic means. We all, uh, you know, I mean, for example, my organization and I personally, we wrote the reports about all these civilians living so close to the, uh, to the um, front line, especially on the Azerbaijani side, that there are hundreds of thousands of people living there and any kind of fighting will definitely put them uh, in, into threat. And, uh, and what's happening now is that we have to wait for, I don't know, some sort of terrible things like ethnic cleans and or something in order to activate some uh, in, in internationally known and uh, mechanism, mechanisms uh, that are there, you know, in, in, the, um, in, in different kind of charters and prescribed in different documents. This is really very sad to see, you know, that with instead of doing uh, to prevent, in, in, in sort of, a, in, instead of acting to prevent something, we still have to follow. 
follow in order to wait for the action. And uh, yeah, I, I would probably stop here. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Lucia. Uh, and uh, uh, Bahtier, before uh, your introductory remarks, can you tell us where are you uh, talking from? There was a question if there is any. Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, okay. I also would like to hi, uh, say hi, everybody. Uh, right now, I'm based in Tbilisi uh, uh, for a few months because of the COVID 19. Um, First of all, I would like to wish everybody peace and peaceful region, uh, which uh, even though the, the hopes are quite uh, small. Uh, to be honest, it's a little bit uh, emotional and difficult for me to talk. Uh, <clears throat> why? Because first I'm from the Karabakh region, I'm an IDP. And plus uh, I also um, have uh, several relatives or I don't know, family members who are in this uh, conflict zone. and. Uh, sometimes we don't hear uh, for a long time. Uh, I would say, like I, I, I share the, the, the some of the previous comments uh, or criticism or I don't know arguments, but um, I also would like to highlight the, the, the on the my points on the ones that I don't agree, um, which especially are not proved uh, so far yet. But um, before that. Um, uh, I would like to highlight that why this war started, I think, even though you had a discussion on this. Uh, of course, there are a lot of uh, the layers of this conflict, uh, either regional or, I don't know, geopolitical or like the internal issues. Uh, but uh, if we sum up all of everything, we, I would say that uh, this war restarted or this conflict re-escalated because of the miscalculation or mis-evaluation by either uh, the sides of the conflicts or by international um, organizations like uh, OSC Minsk Group or even like the, uh, the, the organization uh, which have been involved in peace building activism for uh, decades. Uh, as a, I don't know whether I'm, let's say as a representative of this uh, track two, track three diplomacy, uh, I also um, highlight um, this as a failure of these, uh, let's say, uh, stakeholders, uh, especially when you see this, um, let's say, peace activists or the resources that have been uh, have been uh, invested for peace, but then uh, all these resources turn to be, let's say, um, the supporter or propaganda of the war uh, in last, uh, uh, let's say, few weeks. Uh, Right now, I mean, uh, let's say the failed uh, mediation process of the, the, the OSMS group uh, shows that this um, agency or entity is not capable of uh, dealing with the, with the conflict in a peaceful way, I will just really. And, and especially when we look at the, the other conflicts, um, let's say in Balkans, like uh, we can see that um, there is uh, there's a need uh, for leverage by the mediators, which we can't see uh, mainly, or we can see in a disbalanced uh, way. Um, in this case, I would see the, the, the role of uh, the Russia and Turkey more visible uh, in, in, in a diplomatic resolution of the conflict. And even the, the latest talk, uh, phone talk between Putin and uh, Erdogan shows that um, uh, this is more um, uh, close to the reality than the, let's say the other, either the, the, the US or the France or which I don't find it quite uh, practical, uh, especially nowadays. Um, when this conflict might end, I would say first uh, either one part or the, the both parts uh, or sides of the conflict might get tired or exhausted uh, militarily or politically uh, in this war. Um, or it also depends on the development uh, of the military operations. Uh, right now, for example, I mean, as far as we hear from uh, either from the uh, Armenian side or Azerbaijani sides, uh, the, the, the military of uh, militaries of both sides are fighting in a, a strategic points like Lachian corridor or I don't know in a, like the mountainous areas that um, Armenia has been stockpiling all the militaries for decades there. Uh, 
uh, and uh, this uh, the clashes. I mean, the, the, this uh, the war has been almost like the last three days. I would say that they are fighting over these uh, strategic points. Uh, it also, I mean, the, the let's say the development of the war or the end of the the, the war might also depend on these uh, points. Um, Arzu just highlighted the, the the military support of Turkey, which I totally disagree with. Even though I I I, I highly appreciate Arzu's uh, all activities, um, because there is no uh, let's say tangible uh, proof about it. Um, that um, of course Turkey has been expressing its uh, readiness to to support to Azerbaijan uh, from the beginning of the the, the let's say the, this war. But we haven't seen, we don't have uh, any um, proof about it. And it also applies for the, 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 the claim by uh, Olesia about the Syrian fighters, which is, I would say, it's totally, um, I don't know, propagated uh, uh, things. Um, you know, like, uh, I mean, th th this is almost more than a month that the war started and this claim started even the, from the beginning of this uh the, the war and there is no any proof uh, i mean everybody says just ah you know like my friend's friend told me that somebody exists here guys i mean we cannot uh talk about we cannot argue on this kind of things uh there is no any video or either photo uh proof of it i mean uh, yeah i mean you mentioned that we are this war is a modern or modern technology uh, war, but come on, I mean, uh, there are several reasons that I mean, I, I don't say that it's, it doesn't exist. I, 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 I refrain to argue on anything, but I'm, I'm saying that there is no first proof, there is no any motivation. I don't see, like, if you if we think rationally, I don't see any uh, rational argument behind that uh, this would uh, be involved. And the lady, the journalist, I don't call, I'm sorry, but I don't call her a journalist, but the journalist, who uh, propagated this word is in Armenia, and 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 she has been acting as a like the propaganda machine of uh, Armenian defense minister guys, and uh, the photos that they were sharing, I have on my phone, that uh, like uh, because the, the one of the argument was that these uh, Syrian fighters uh, are part of the border guards of Azerbaijan. Like, first of all, uh, let's make it clear that. Uh, the borders of um, I mean, border guards of Azerbaijan Republic is not involved in the war. They're responsible for the uh, only border regions. They're not in uh, in the heavy fightings. Plus, um, uh, and these I would say the border guards of Azerbaijan is more uh, technological from the technological perspective uh, is more equipped than the military uh, defense minister of Azerbaijan. I mean, uh, I'm telling you uh, this as a kind of a person who has an information about this. I don't want to go to the details. And um, I mean, if you don't uh, agree with my points, you can raise your points, but I would recommend you to check like the, this Lindsay, uh, this journalist uh, Twitter account, you will see what I mean. And plus this, uh, the, the latest uh, videos, photos, shared by the defense minister of Armenia, which they wear the uniform of border guards of Azerbaijan, uh, um, it also appeared within the photo with the defense minister of Armenia, Tonoyan, together uh, with the uh, Armenian soldiers in Karabakh. Uh, we can't speculate. I mean, I totally disagree. We can't explain like arguments saying that, uh, you know, like, yeah, there is something, yeah. I don't know, like, it's totally nonsense for me, like, to talk about these kind of things. Um, um, and especially, like, uh, like this also highlighted by uh, uh, Olesia, like, just, um, uh, let's say, populating people or just putting civilians in the front line. Uh, and she especially highlighted the Azerbaijan. I, I'm diet. sorry, I didn't say that, Bakhtiar. You are now definitely interpreting something that I did not no, say. No, but uh, I'm just saying that... I'll give you a floor right after Yeah, that. yeah, but... Uh, no, no, you... I don't want even to get into arguments, but I did not say that, so don't... What, what didn't you say? Sorry, I would like to hear you. Point. Yeah, I, I was saying that there are many people, tens of thousands, there are 160,000 people living within 15 kilometers from 
the line of contact on the Azerbaijani side, which is according to the statistic over the Azerbaijani State Department and from the yeah. census of 2009. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I so did I, I see anyone think... sample there, people? No, no one, sorry? I did not. I did not say that, what you're ascribing to me. This is what I'm How saying. How did I express, sorry, just. Uh, can, I, can I intervene for a second? Yeah, uh, sure. I, I completely understand, and yes, we need to respond to each other's arguments, but uh, the idea is more, uh, more of this discussion is to give a bigger picture and to let our audience to listen uh, to the yeah. positions and arguments on different sides. Again, of course, we do hear each other and we do respond to each other, but let's not make it personal and uh, talk in more general terms. Yeah. But again, no, I mean, I will yeah. finish and then make up. Uh, yeah, I mean, what I, I didn't want to accuse anybody. I don't want to accuse anybody because this is the, like the, the, the discussion we, we, we decided to take apart because we want to find out, you know, like, we are not coming here to defend the position of either Armenia or Azerbaijan. Uh, what I wanted to say that, let's say, the populating or just the uh, residing these places, either from Azerbaijan side or from Armenian side, has been obvious, let's say, for uh, decades. Uh, even not even uh, from the other, let's say, um, the regions, like even like from the Lebanon or from Syria, like especially in Shusha, in Stepanakert, or other uh, towns, uh, or even uh, putting the military equipment in the civilian areas is also visible. I mean, it's also uh, one of the facts that we can't, uh, let's say, uh, deny on this uh, uh, these arguments. Uh, and uh, I don't know, like, uh, I also would like to a little bit go back, for, uh, like, uh, why this war started. I mean, I think, um, again, uh, I don't know, Oli, I'm sorry, just maybe I'm referring to you, but just, uh, <laughs> but uh, you, you used like the post-war, um, like the term, which um, the, I think that was one of the, the, the mistakes that we perceived, I personally, myself, just we perceived this nine, after the, the, the period after the 90s war, like the first Nagorno-Karabakh war, like as a post-war um, period. Um, and um, it was mis, um, uh, mis evaluation at least uh, within the society of Azerbaijan and within society of Armenia, because they had totally different approach, like the win-lose approach, uh, which we, we under, under, underestimated uh, for a while. Uh, and that's why we, we, we observe right now, we witness that how the, even the societies um, uh, are pro-war, even like the people who support peace and then uh, then they uh, at the end of their messages you see that just uh, stop aggression or I don't know like uh, totally very uh, strange messages that you see that um, the, the value of peace has not been uh, absorbed properly uh, in this society. Uh, I'm sorry maybe I sound very critical uh, on this but I also see myself as, a, as a, one of the stakeholders uh, that at least has been working uh, in this uh, conflict for a few years uh, and I also uh, find myself in this, uh, let's say, um, the failure uh, or failed situation. Thank you so much. Uh, I would be happy to answer any questions, any comments or any critics. Thank you, Bartia. Uh, Olicia, do you want to respond now or we go to Eka and then get back for the second? No, no I, I think there is no point, honestly, uh, because I don't want to get into bilateral debate because I think that we, especially those who are attending, uh, I think they have enough of this kind of, you know, uh, debate. And uh, I think it's better to proceed. I may have uh, my remarks later on. And uh, thank you so much for giving me an opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Olicia. Eka. Um, well, we've, we've all heard it, but uh, I still want to go back to the initial question that I've asked uh, at the start of this uh, web discussion. Why now? And what's role for the international players? Bakhtiar was saying that uh, Minsk process or Minsk dialogue uh, failed in its mediation attempt. And we all have a feeling that lots of international instruments failed in both cases, not just in Nagorno-Karabakh, but in, in, in Georgian conflict and occupation. Uh, cases as well. But why now? Uh, why uh, with such a uh, strength? And why um, why do we all have the feeling that uh, something big is missing on the international level? Eka, turn on the mic. 
Uh, thank you very much, Tina, for a very kind uh, introduction and for organizing this timely event. Uh, greetings to the panelists and participants. Um, I feel honored to be able to comment on the current situation. Um, the situation is extremely difficult. Uh, it's uh, really difficult to be a neighbor in a neighborhood where uh, by now, according to various uh, accounts, more than 5,000 people have died, including military and the civilians. And there is no visible uh, mechanism in place that would uh, direct the process towards uh, non-military uh, solutions. And uh, to delve into the question that Tina has posed, what is happening and uh, why now, uh, let's uh, maybe I will try to look at a wider picture uh, and uh, go one by one uh, what the actors' roles are and uh, perhaps should have been uh, in the past. Uh, first of all, uh, the region is fraught with frozen conflicts uh, and uh, once and again we are uh, dealt with the reality that conflicts cannot be frozen forever. It will, um, it will, it will at some point uh, spill over into a hot phase. Uh, we have seen little or no progress towards settling any of the frozen conflicts, conflicts in Abkhazia, in Nagorno-Karabakh, in South Ossetia. Uh, there have been parties who have failed to deliver on the uh, conflict settlement processes, both local actors and international actors. Uh, as for the conflict at hand, uh, we have a situation uh, which has been uh, unsolved for more than uh, 30 years now. Uh, but what has been in place, it has also lacked implementation. Uh, what has been in place is the Madrid principles, the updated Madrid principles that were announced in uh, 2009, uh, and uh, to which apparently both local actors, both Azerbaijan and Armenia, have given their political support. Uh, and uh, because none of these uh, demands have been met, we have had in the region an asymmetrical balance of power. One party being happy with the status quo and another party being extremely unhappy with the status quo and waiting for international actors to find diplomatic solutions to the problem. Uh, and now we find ourselves in a global uh, situation where uh, we have a changing United States strategic uh, outlook uh, for four years, for the uh, past uh, four years with the Trump administration, the US has uh, been more inward looking, uh, more um, isolationist, but also more unilateralist in terms of solving problems related to global order. Uh, so we've seen this global order uh, somehow crumble at the fringes, uh, not only in our region, but in many other regions around the globe as well. We've seen the rise of authoritarianism, uh, and uh, we are, of, of course, uh, faced with the bigger problem uh, that transcends borders, which is the COVID-19. And we are uh, faced with a situation of uh, uh, US elections, which are to uh, be held on November 3. That means all the external actors who should be involved, who should be organizing frantically the international diplomatic uh, mechanisms to uh, stop the ongoing I know, uh, hot phase of the war, uh, they're extremely busy with uh, their own problems. Uh, they're a bit more inward looking and they're faced with bigger problems than ever before. And that has uh, brought us to the situation, uh, a local situation where COVID-19, the shortages of water, uh, and of, of course, uh, the changing military um, landscape has also contributed to the uh, current situation. And another uh, global dimension, which I must uh, definitely underline, is the uh, extreme fatigue with uh, democratic interventionism or interventionism in general. Uh, we have international actors, including the United States and the European uh, Union and separate countries of the European Union, 
uh, really tired with unsuccessful interventions in Iraq, in Syria, in Afghanistan, we are again faced with the reality that even in the 21st century, nationalism remains as the dominant ideology. Uh, and it's not possible to build a democracy overnight. Uh, democracy building uh, requires a long-term commitment. Uh, and this commitment is sometimes weakened, weakened with another uh, democratic uh, side, uh, an important one, but uh, as a negative side effect is the changing administrations. Uh, there is no continuous strong commitment to the uh, interventionist wars that previous administrations have started. Therefore, we have uh, very uh, lukewarm results from very expensive and very um, uh, costly in terms of humanitarian uh, side wars, like in, uh, again in Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan. Uh, and because of that, we again, just like in early 90s, we again have humanitarian catastrophes that have very little international attention. I could name Yemen and Syria, uh, and Yemen and Myanmar, uh, and apparently now Nagorno-Karabakh as well, because as other participants have underlined, we see uh, international actors simply missing in action. Now, uh, in this uh, situation, uh, we have an outcome where uh, the conflict has been going on for uh, a month, for a month. And for me, as an outside observer, the real question now is whether uh, what is the military uh, strategic goal for Azerbaijan and what other actors are going to do uh, around it. Uh, so uh, is Azerbaijan uh, going to uh, go through with and uh, retake those seven regions that were uh, to be freed by Armenia a long time ago based on the Madrid principles? Or will the military action go even farther? And where do uh, in other international actors come in? We've seen uh, like... Um, uh, very questionable silence and inactivity from Russia. Uh, whereas uh, for decades we have uh, been used to the idea that Russia is Armenia's first and foremost ally. Uh, it, it's a treaty ally, it has a commitment to protect Armenia, but uh, in this uh, situation, uh, the uh, actor is Azerbaijan and Nagorno-Karabakh. And um, it's interesting to see, not only interesting, but uh, from Armenian perspective, they must have uh, many questions towards Russia, what its role uh, uh, is uh, in the whole situation. Uh, and uh, uh, about other actors. So here we also see the shortcomings of international communities, inability to come up with an uh, effective international or collective security measures. United Nations is missing in action. I haven't even heard anybody trying to put the issue on the UN Security Council uh, agenda. Uh, as for uh, EU, uh, EU also has many of its fatigues. Uh, it is somewhat disengaged. Uh, the uh, activity within the OSC means group has been very fragmented. Uh, we've seen three ceasefires reached, but there is no cohesion and unity in this. Uh, Russia has brokered almost unilaterally first two ceasefires, and then now the United States, none of them have hold up. Um, France has taken somewhat partial uh, uh, attitude in the uh, whole process, and uh, there is no unified OSC Minsk group joint action. That, of course, is, of course, is exacerbated by uh, the ongoing uh, COVID challenge that people aren't able to get together and travel freely, uh, which, uh, of course, com compounded in a very unfavorable humanitarian uh, situation um, and huge cost of war already uh, after one month, nearly 5,000 people and billions of dollars worth of military technology uh, on both sides. 
uh, so who is to play a bigger role and when is a more active solution to uh, be put in place? That is the real question uh, now. Uh, and to continue the point on EU, EU has uh, tried to be active in the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, but has failed on many uh, accounts. Uh, there has been another uh, actor, Turkey, who has been trying to become part of the either the uh, Minsk group or become a separate presence in the region. Uh, probably Turkey will gain this possibility uh, in the aftermath of the current conflict because there simply aren't other actors who are interested enough to be part of the uh, solution of the uh, uh, parameters of the ongoing uh, conflict. So uh, as for Georgia, uh, I would also voice my opinion of what Georgia's role should be. Uh, we, we should continue to maintain strict neutrality in terms of military, uh, however, be open to uh, be part of the negotiations, but also to look out for our, no, our own uh, problems, both internally and uh, internationally, and uh, really keep a hand on the pulse of the ongoing situation uh, and uh, study the um, positions of international actors and local actors uh, alike. Uh, so uh, I will stop here, but I will be happy to answer uh, any questions that could come to my direction. Thank you. Thank you, Eka. Thank you very much. Um, we have uh, lots of questions coming, and uh, obviously uh, you can respond to the uh, to the comments that uh, our panelists uh, were making. But also, let me hear a couple of them, and maybe you'll be willing to pick up uh, some of those and uh, answer during your interventions. We have a, a question from Elsbeth Sutters asking about the incentives uh, for President Aliyev. What incentives might Aliyev have to resume negotiations? At the moment, the war is still very popular and Azeri side is making progress. Russia has expressed unwillingness to engage heavily so long as the fighting is not in Armenia itself. So what could incentive, uh, what could be incentives uh, stopping uh, Aliyev uh, from uh, hostilities? That's uh, one of the questions that we have. Uh, there is a question for Eka, uh, directed to Eka, but again, uh, any, uh, any of the panelists can answer about the um, involvement of Georgia. Uh, I don't know how you see the role of Georgia. Eka already told us her opinion and I cannot be subscribed to it. Um, but the question is about the humanitarian aid coming from Russia for Armenia and Georgia stopping it on the borders on a different pretext. And uh, because due to the Russia-Georgia relationship itself. And the question is whether that is legitimate or not uh, for, for that purpose to stop, the, uh, to stop any um, uh, traffic from Russia to, to Armenia. And also, uh, there is a question about uh, bottom-up peace-building initiatives supported in the past uh, decades by the European Union, uh, such as the e EPNK. Uh, what has failed there? Do you see any future for the, ki for the kind of civil society initiatives in the light of uh, current re-escalation of the war? Basically, um, the, uh, this question is about uh, probably something that all of us were involved at uh, one point or another, uh, being it uh, regarding Nagorno-Karabakh or Abkhazia and South Ossetian conflicts. And, uh, and I would be uh, really glad to hear your response to that, to the possibility of restarting similar, uh, similar initiatives. So um, I don't know, maybe we will do the same order. Arzu, if you can start. Sure, thank you. Um, I think I would like to start with clarifying something that um, uh, Bakhtiar mentioned about <clears throat> my uh, uh, point on Turkish-Azerbaijan cooperation. Um, when I said that there is a military support, I meant the purchase of Turkish um, military equipment that has been happening. Um, I believe, if I'm not wrong, um, Azerbaijan bought $123 million worth of military equipment just in the last year. Um, and just wanted to clarify that because I don't know 
if you misunderstood what I was saying with that regard. Um, I would try and take on Elspeth and um, the question from Lara on the initiatives, uh, peace building initiatives. I think the incentives for Aliyev has been very clear for him in order, in order for him to come to a negotiation table or stop this current conflict. Um, he wants to see what he has been asking for since the start of this conflict. Um, but we're seeing up until now, um, especially in the last four weeks, that the demands are not, um, the, the two sides are not meeting with their demands and hence um, President Nhamaliyev is pushing with his rhetoric that unless there is full, um, ret full exit of the Armenian forces from Nagorno-Karabakh, there won't be a conversation on, on peace. So this is clearly the men and this is the, the, the only incentive that will bring him back to the negotiating table unless there is some other form of agreement reached, um, which I don't really know what it could be at this point, um, especially in light of the recent events, um, especially in light of recently um, acquired new territories, return territories um, that the Azerbaijani army has been able to, to return. Um, so obviously this is, this goes back to what I was trying to say that the whole geography uh, of this conflict has changed um, and a lot of elements have changed. So clearly um, um, this also signals that the incentives are changing. And again, uh, one of the incentives would be uh, what President Hamaliev has been saying from the start. Um, as for the um, track two initiatives, I think this is, this is this sort of very personal to me because I've also worked on track two initiatives for many years. Um, and, you know, for one of the things that I always hoped for to see was that um, these track two initiatives grow and scale because at the time when they were happening, there were very different organizations during different meetings, different workshops, um, but only few really um, kind of touched the relations to the core. You know, there, there were a lot of collaborative projects, but not many that would address the grievances, the needs, the fears of the two communities. And I think that was, that was missing from, from the track two initiatives of, as, as a whole. I also think they were happening not enough um, and not um, uh, reaching out to, to larger communities. I think that was one of the other issues uh, with, with track two initiatives. Some of them were very successful. Some had really great outcomes, but again, they were very small in comparison to the problem, which is really big, um, and which basically means that there is no confidence, there is no trust between the societies. And we're seeing this even more now with all the negative um, emotions that we're witnessing online with, with people blaming each other, you know, comments like, I wish the other side never existed, um, they should all die. And, you know, this is not the healthy um, atmosphere in which we can actually discuss potential for peace and peaceful coexistence. Um, and that brings me to my last point that these programs um, were only happening within sort of by the initiative of international organizations or non-governmental organizations. Had they been strengthened by the two sides, by the two um, governments and taken on a larger scale um, and supported had they been supported openly, um, I think that would have probably paved the way for um, not just a very small group of people uh, getting engaged in these small initiatives, but a much bigger impact on both societies. So, you know, the, the scale of it, the timing of it, um, the, uh, the, yeah, how small, small these initiatives were. And last but not least, I think, um, even when there were meetings between the government officials um, between that were either organized by the OEC Minsk group or in any other format, I think this is where the civil society representatives had to be as well. Because having witnessed the conversation that was happening, not behind the closed doors, but openly, uh, would have helped to strengthen this you know, civil society rhetoric, whatever it was or could have been. Uh, but because we never saw that happen, uh, maybe with, with an exception of one or two meetings when there were maybe one, one and a half initiatives, 
uh, diplomacy initiatives where government officials would sit down together with um, civil society representatives and have an actual open conversation about where they stand and what they plan on doing. Um, I think this is where this this is where there was a failure. Um, and after this point, I think if there are people left on both sides who are willing to engage in these confidence building measures, because their work that they've been doing up until now has been pushed 20 years back, completely ruining and destroying everything that's been done. So if there are people who are still willing to take on this really difficult task to find even interested community representatives who want to engage in dialogue, then perhaps we need to first figure out how it's going to be done, in what format, in what context, and also who will be sitting at that table. That will be all. Uh, thank you, Arzu. Uh, thank you very much for that comment. And I, uh, uh, judging or talking from the experience of a country where something similar happened in 2008, and we also all had a feeling that uh, all the work done by civil society was thrown away 20 years uh, back and uh, all the peace initiatives that looked like very promising were uh, basically lost. Um, we do have an optimism to say that there are lots of people ready to re-engage and uh, be part of the, to start everything basically from the beginning and be part of the similar activities as, as years back uh, in order to bring communities together and to at least facilitate solving the problem on people to people basis and to leave it up to the politicians for the final solutions, obviously, but to somehow prepare the societies for the better uh, life and coexistence. And here, I think it's only fair to add to the questions that, uh, that I posed in the beginning from the, you know, from the audience, a uh, similar question about the Prime Minister uh, Pashinian, um, as we were asking about President Aliyev, is to what's what's the political future for for Pashinia under the current circumstances and uh, and also uh, there was an uh, there was a question about the uh, uh, eligibility of a country being part of the Minsk group if they are part of the war itself so if you can also respond to those questions that would be that would be helpful Alicia maybe you will continue. Yeah, I will. Uh, can I just build on uh, what Arzu said? Because I fully subscribe to her assessment of, uh, of what where we are in terms of uh, what I, I've been observing in the Azerbaijani and Armenian societies. Um, I think there is one very important thing that we for, we are forgetting. The Nagorno-Karabakh context and all these dialogue processes, unlike, for example, in the Georgian case, it was a very closed process. And in many cases, uh, they were discussing different peace proposals, you know, different kind of formulas, but no one ever dared to bring it to the societies, you know, or as Arzu said, invite civil society to get their assessment, to get what, how they will proceed. Maybe they will have some certain assessment. And lack of this kind of debate, I think, left us with a uh, situation when currently the war is ongoing and people are discussing and mentioning basic principles without really understanding that these basic principles is about something more comprehensive rather than just the return of territories. Uh, the issue of status uh, that uh, they were discussing and inventing different kind of ways, you know, how to grant status to Nagorno-Karabakh is completely gone from any kind of discussion right now. And the issue of security provisions is only attached to the Russian uh, peacekeeping issue, which is not, uh, uh, I mean, uh, even when, uh, even before the war, when we spoke to the Azerbaijani and Armenian officials and people in Stepanakert, they clearly said that we don't want uh, military presence here. We, we uh, have survived, you know, and we have protected our people for more than 20 years. So why would we want uh, an external force to come in now. So at that time, we as a crisis group actually suggested a discussion on civilian observance, you know? And so there are the things that are completely gone and they are not part of any kind of mainstream discussions. Um, especially now during the war when everyone realizes that there, are, there is no peace plan that can replace um, the, the current fighting. And uh, um, Look, uh, I think uh, this, this was a real mistake uh, made by those who invented uh, 
um, with Foreman in the 90s and who continued to follow with tradition of having this peace process in the hands of only two leaders and uh, a small number of diplomats that would never ever even share any kind of small detail. Even the Lavrov plan in 2016, it helped to see the escalation in, in Nagorno-Karabakh because at that time, Moscow at least could tell to Baku that don't worry, you can take with, uh, you can get with territories through peace, so stop the fighting, but then the Russians did not deliver. Even that Lavrov plan has been denied till very recently that that existed, you know? and. So I think uh, it was it something to kind of uh, take into account when we are discussing uh, how we kind of came to this point when the fighting started and the fighting escalated and, and uh, who is to blame. If you ask me, I can give you, uh, probably we will write uh, several volumes of books of who is to blame and how it happened, yeah. Um, when it comes to the future of Nikol Pashinyan, uh, I have been in Yerevan since Friday and uh, this is one of the main questions that I, I'm asking and uh, around. And I think uh, the, um, when even I was not here and especially discussing it with some people who are uh, living in the West or some in some distant pla places, I think we have, uh, we missed something and I could not feel it till I came here actually, you know, that uh, with feeling or with unity, uh, around uh, the government, around the, uh, the leader, it's only reinforcing now. And it's not only rallying around the flag. It is the feeling that um, if uh, we actually do something now to Nikol Pashinyan, for, for instance, that will be, that can potentially lead to uh, the fact that we will lose our statehood. And uh, look, I mean, we, these people have been living with this uh, Armenian state for 30 years. And there is this kind of feeling that this is ours. So we need to keep a stability. We may have a questions to him or to other people, you know, during this war, but these questions will come only after the war. And we will have a discussion only later on. So for the moment, uh, all this kind of speculation that uh, especially I hear, you know, when I get asked about this uh, on a regular basis by different diplomats, officials and uh, analysts, uh, uh, foreign analysts, um, I, I, I have a feeling that uh, for definitely during this war, you know, even if uh, some certain incident happens, or like, let's say someone tries to kill him, uh, Mr. Pashinyan, yeah, I hope that <laughs> nothing like this happens, but still, you know, if um, that will be, there will be resistance from such a strong resistance from the uh, society internally because it's not only about Pashinyan right now, it is about uh, survival of the statehood. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, thank you very much. And Bakhtiar, uh, while us answering the question, maybe you can take on another one as well, is to yeah, I mean, indeed. The media coverage of the war in Azerbaijan. There was a so, sorry, sorry. Times, there was a question several times repeated, why international media is not allowed to cover the uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 yeah, I'll come to this point, uh, but before that, uh, I would like to highlight that as I partially misunderstood you, but uh, partially not, because I know that just sometimes the that uh, we argue something or we say something, but it's just also misinterpreted uh, in different contexts. That's why it was also purposefully. Uh, like the raising this issue that you could explain your points uh, partially. Uh, and at the same time, I also tried to, uh, let's say, create a balance, like which uh, Eka already highlighted the, as a role of the Russia uh, in a military uh, aspects uh, as a support because of, 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 um, of course, Russia has been also selling uh, military to Armenia, but uh, we know that there's a Russian uh, military basement in Armenia in Gumbri and also like the Russia has been um, like the providing uh, military equipments even from the beginning of the latest war, uh, especially through uh, Iran and also like the uh, over the Caspian Sea, uh, which uh, which is uh, Iranian Iran side, and also like we even see like when when the the, the, the military troops of uh, Azerbaijan approach to the border with our uh, with Armenia, like in, in Zengilan area, uh, we we saw the videos uh, showing the Russian um, uh, flags, which Rush uh, which Russia is responsible for the protection of the border of Armenia. Uh, or recently, we also see, I mean, I personally saw a video 
uh, the, uh, seeing the, 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 the killed uh, soldiers, which uh, we saw, like I saw, like the, the, the Russia. Uh, it's written Russia. I don't know. I don't claim that with whether this is the Russian soldiers or Russian uh, supported soldiers, but this is what I mean. Uh, that's why I just highlighted. I mean, that's why I also in the beginning mentioned that uh, I, as a mediator. Uh, or as mediators, I see Russia and Turkey more, um, let's say, um, more pragmatic uh, than the others, uh, which are far from this region, which uh, don't have any uh, leverage on the parties of the conflicts to uh, push them for the compromise. Uh, 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 regarding to the 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 the, the uh, journalists, of course, in the beginning, the Azerbaijan uh, side was. Uh, very reluctant to involve international media outlets or journalists uh, in the region, especially because of the 2016 April war. Uh, they, uh, Azerbaijan had very negative uh, experience, uh, especially with the, the journalists from Russia. Um, uh, they literally were propagating uh, in different ways, which uh, was not interest of uh, Azerbaijan. That's why this time they were uh, uh, a little bit more careful on this, but uh, they always, I mean, especially Hikmat Hajiyev, who is the, uh, the the assistant of the president, just highlighted several times uh, to invite uh, the representative of international organizations uh, who are based in Turkey. Uh, I don't know why mainly Turkey, but um, this is how he mentioned. And, and plus, I think uh, Azerbaijan is also uh, reluctant to let the international, uh, especially also like the local journalists to get in the fighting areas uh, because of the, the, the um, uh, unexpected uh, casualties. Like the, recently, I think it happened either yesterday or the day before yesterday, the, the journalists of the Euronews uh, uh, were uh, traveling to, I think either Talush uh, village or somewhere and they were almost shot uh, by Armenian. Uh, the New York Times. So there's a read. Sorry. The journalist from New York Times. Yeah, uh, it, it it happened in Barda, but then before that, it was also a year in use in Talish region. Uh, there was a video like how the this rocket is coming close to their um, the the cars, or like let's say the 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 uh, the uh, the French journalist was uh, injured or wounded in in Karabakh when uh, who just uh, went to uh, to Karabakh from Armenian side. This this kind of uh, example showed that I mean we have to be quite uh, careful on this. I totally share uh, Arzu's and Olesia's points about the track to um, issues. Uh, it's sad, but we have to express it. Uh, and I strongly agree with uh, with Arzu about like the the. Uh, not touching up on the, the the taboo topics which uh, uh, which are related to the the Nagorno Karabakh conflict. Yeah, we had been having a lot of track two, track three issue uh, diplomacies or activities, but everything talked about everything except the 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 pains or emotions or uh, memories, either negative or positive of the uh, memories of these people. I think that was one of the biggest mistakes that we did and. Uh, right now, to be honest, I'm not so optimistic about uh, the uh, quick, uh, let's say, uh, the recovery of uh, the track two or track three uh, diplomacies or civil society initiative activities. Um, like um, I personally, within the framework of the Berkow Foundation, we were uh, conducting these kind of activities until 27th of September. Uh, we even didn't stop uh, in July escalation, uh, which the size was smaller uh, because we deal with the past. We talk about everything, uh, memories, uh, everything. Uh, but this time it didn't work because it's more deadly. The, the war is more deadly and it's unexpected uh, things. And uh, I also share Arzu's points about the incentives of Aliyev to stop the war. I think, uh, uh, yeah, he just uh, clearly mentioned, of course, uh, in the behind of the curtains, there, there might be other issues, but um, at least in the public or the media, I mean, he highlights that just he wants the re restoration of the, 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 um, the territorial in integrity of Azerbaijan, or just let's say um, he wants the Armenian troops to withdraw, to be withdrawn from, uh, from the occupied territories. Um, 
and and there was also another question about F-16s. Um, I mean, um, President of Azerbaijan also highlighted that okay, they're they're in Azerbaijan, definitely. I mean. Uh, I don't know the numbers exactly, uh, but uh, they are not either. F I mean, they are not involved in the process. I mean, the, the war right now. But whenever there is another uh, third, uh, let's say, involvement, uh, there is a possibility to involve this F-16s. Uh, uh, and I don't think uh, in this case. I mean, this is very. Uh, this is really needed, uh, at least from from the Azerbaijan side. Uh, to involve F-16s uh, because they have a lot of uh, uh, drones or I don't know other other equipments or even like different uh, sophisticated tanks uh, which either are not both uh, either from Russia or Turkey as far as I remember like from Serbia or somewhere. Uh, yes, I don't know. I mean, I would like to stop here and uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I'm reminded of time, so uh, let me go to Eka uh, for the final words. And I wanna, if I if I can ask you, Eka, also on top of uh, responding to to the questions that were already posed and comments made by our panelists, um, the uh, my question will be: What's next? How to mm -hmm. go from here? What is the uh, resource left? Uh, here was a question from the audience also about the civil society. Uh, and Alicia was also saying that at these times, in difficult times during the war, people tend to stand uh, behind their leaders, and this is completely understandable. And uh, uh, it was the same in Georgia during the August War, regardless of all the uh, all the uh, problems and differences between the opposition at that time and the President Saakashvili. We all remember the uh, uh, moratorium that the opposition announced during the war about criticizing the government or. Uh, or going against the government's decisions, but once the uh, once the bullets will stop and hopefully they will stop being fired, uh, what is the room you can see for uh, uh, for the maneuver for civil society, journalists, academia to get involved uh, on a higher speed and uh, have communities brought together? Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, Tina. Uh, there were two or three questions directed to me, uh, and they were mostly about passage of uh, cargo, uh, humanitarian cargo from Georgia to Armenia. It is alleged that Georgia is not letting, but it's really not true. It's a disinformation, uh, mostly spread by uh, Russian funded media outlets in Georgia or outside of Georgia. Uh, there has been a, decl a declaration and press conference on this issue from Ministry of uh, Economy and also from Armenian uh, embassy in Georgia. Uh, basically daily nearly 750 to uh, 800 uh, cargo uh, trolleys are crossing across uh, our border with Armenia and Azerbaijan. Uh, these are, uh, except for the military goods, military good transfer has been banned. Uh, so uh, if the question is why are we not uh, allowing humanitarian uh, goods, we are allowing and uh, it would be uh, really uh, good if we uh, didn't fall into a Russian disinformation trap because this is a long standing and uh, old policy of Russia to divide and rule and now is definitely not the time to follow into that trap once again. As for the question, what we could uh, hear from the, what would be the uh, uh, possible outcome for the conflict within next months? Um, uh, I, I, I can say what would be the uh, most relevant uh, and uh, peace-oriented uh, outcome. Uh, in my understanding, it, it would be to get back uh, to the framework of the updated Madrid principles. Uh, to um, uh, let uh, people uh, come back to their places of re residence, to put in place the security measures to provide for the security of the people who are living there locally and of the people who would come back to live to their places of residences, and to start negotiations on the status of the Nagorno-Karabakh and to move this issue uh, into the negotiating uh, uh, rooms. 
in this, uh, uh, this is this especially where the role of civil society and uh, tractor diplomacy could come in, you know, really to uh, reach an agreeable uh, solution to both sides and to settle the conflict. Because as we are seeing, again, freezing the conflict, leaving it in an unsolved limbo where no parties uh, where parties, none of the parties' uh, uh, goals overlap and there's no solution to be reached. It's, it is fraught with uh, instability and uh, possible inst instances of uh, explosiveness. So this, in my understanding, would be an ideal situation. But for this, we need active involvement of outside powers outside actors including especially the eu to really uh bring the parties together back to the negotiating table and uh, provide strict and credible guarantees that the madrid principles will be reached in a timely uh, manner but this is an ideal outcome in my understanding. It could go uh, either uh, to the side of uh, you know, uh, ongoing and protracted military uh, action in the theater, uh, or uh, it could uh, go, go to the side of escalation with uh, Russian and then possibly Turkish uh, involvement, which would be the worst outcome because it will completely uh, destroy the regional uh, stability and uh, regional um, peace. Thank you, Eta. Thank you all uh, for your uh, willingness to be part of it. I am uh, sorry once again that we did not have a representative from Armenia, participant from Armenia, but I hope that uh, to a certain level we managed to hear the Yerevan's arguments also during this discussion, although once again it would have been much better having uh, a representative from uh, Armenian think tanks or civil society taking floor during this discussion. As always, we are happy and willing to give them floor at any time as they wish to and uh, to initiate another discussion if they will decide to, uh, to join us. Uh, and let's hope that uh, there is uh, still um, a possibility for the peace in the South Caucasus and possibility of uh, uh, European Union particularly taking up on the initiative and uh, being more active and more involved, regardless of unfinished Brexit and the lockdowns and COVID-19 disaster and all the problems the world is facing today and European Union countries are facing today. I believe that there is no alternative to building peace uh, and helping peace to, to be at place in, uh, in any part of the world, actually, for that matter, and particularly in the neighborhood of the European Union. Thank you once again. Thank you to the Friedrich Naumann uh, Foundation for, for allowing us to have this uh, talk today and uh, hope to see you uh, soon talking about the peace and possibility for further cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.